But as you know, Peter is uh, the CEO of Tihiku Media. I'm trying to get that right, Suzanne, so thank you for helping me. Um, but he's also a famous broadcaster in his native language and native folks, and he's award-winning, as I say, Maori broadcaster. His innovative work in the intersection of language, AI, and indigenous rights is remarkable. And as someone said to me over the course of the past few days, Peter, that you are a legend. So we are so delighted to have Peter with us. And I want you to give him a warm welcome as he presents his presentation. Thank you. Kote iwi Māori Tātā Ko ngā tau ngā piripono O ngā tūpuna Ko te aroha Me te mana Me te tino rangatiratanga E No reira tēnā koutou Tēnā koutou Tēnā koutou katoa Ko P. Lucas Jones tō ku ingoa, ko te aupauri ngai takoto te rārawa me ngāti kahu o ku iwi. Ka mihi a hau ki te whenua, ki ngā tūpuna kua wehe atu ki te pō, ki koutou te hunga ora, tēnā tātou katoa. I just want to first start by acknowledging ancestors, past, present and future, in te reo Māori, the indigenous language of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's an honor to be here with you today. And I'm going to talk about data sovereignty, kaitiakitanga, and te reo Māori. Next slide, please. First of all, I want to take us back to the future. And our past in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is very much grounded in te tiriti o waitangi when we think about the original agreement that was signed between the British Crown and chiefs of certain tribes on uh, the 6th of February, 1814. It was then carried around to other iwi, other tribal groups, and they signed Te Tiriti o Waitangi too. And it's acknowledged as being the founding document of Aotearoa New Zealand. The purpose of Te Tiriti o Waitangi was to protect Māori rights and property, indigenous rights and property of the people that come from that land. Um, it was to keep peace and order because there was a lot of things going on with the settlers, uh, atrocities being committed against the different tribal groups before Te Tiriti o Waitangi was signed. And it was to establish a government in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Next slide, please. And so our history in Aotearoa, New Zealand, has been marked by many, many breaches of Te Tiriti o Waitangi, breaking those promises time and time again. Nation, language loss and cultural decline, we are reminded about what moved the government to marginalize uh, Maori people in their own homelands. And so Maori language was banned in schools, and over a series of decades, what we saw was language decline amongst whānau, hapu, and iwi, families, sub-tribes, and larger tribes. Te Tiriti o Waitangi uh, Act, or the Treaty of Waitangi Act, was established in 1975, and that established a tribunal. That is regarded as a truth and reconciliation tribunal, and that is a place where tribal groups, Māori people, can take claims for the atrocities and the breaches of uh, Te Tiriti o Waitangi committed against um, uh, those peoples from different places in Aotearoa. Next slide, please. So, where do we come from? We are Te Reo Irirangi o Te Hiku o Te Ika. We are also known as Te Hiku Media. And we are the tribal broadcasters 
of Ngāti Kuri, Te Aupauri, Ngai Takoto, Te Rārawa and Ngāti Kahu. And those are some pictures that represent ways that we have stored data in the past. Our culture is an oral culture and our, co our language is an oral language that ha it has had um, many uh, representations in orthography over the last couple of hundred years and um, as things change we recognize that characters represent sounds and of course yesterday we heard about the archaeology of sound and so we're very much connected with people, place and culture and so what we do is very much connected to identity. Next slide please. Um, why do we exist? Earlier I talked about language loss and cultural decline, and that was a result of systemic racism in Aotearoa, New Zealand, through policies, through law, and through processes. And uh, when we think about uh, language, we're reminded that language is the carrier of culture. And we're reminded that uh, language springs from the life the landscape and the experiences of the people that speak the language. And so our role is very much to promote te reo Māori, to promote Māori language and culture through broadcasting and digital development. Next slide, please. We were formed in 1990, and the journey of iwi broadcasting and the journey of data governance for Māori is very much connected to a legal journey. So we're very much aware of the ways that we must engage to ensure that our rights and interests are protected in a Western framework. And I want to just um, pay attention to the Māori language claim, Y11. I want to make mention of the outcome of the 1994 Privy Council case regarding the sale of state-owned broadcasting assets because it had such a big impact on Māori language broadcasting in Aotearoa. Next slide, please. And so iwi fre um, radio frequencies are issued to different tribal groups. The licenses uh, are used for the purpose of broadcasting in te reo Māori. And, um, and it's important to mention that we embarked on this journey as Te Aupauri, Ngai Takoto, Te Rarawa, Ngāti Kahu uh, and Ngāti Kuri because we wanted to ensure that our language wasn't just an academic experience. We wanted to ensure that our language was a method of communication and contribute to the ongoing intergenerational transmission of language and culture. The government um, acknowledged that we had rights to spectrum in so much as Māori language broadcasting is concerned, but it did not accept that Māori uh, rights to spectrum were because the spectrum was a taonga, or that it was a property of Māori people um, in so much as Te Tiriti or Waitangi, the founding document of Aotearoa, was concerned. But to appease our people, the government offered funding to promote Māori participation in the growing digital economy. And that's when we started to develop uh, our speech-to-text technology and our synthetic voice technology. And why did we do that? Because we believe that Māori solutions must be Māori-led. Indigenous solutions must be Indigenous-led. Next slide, please. So Māori data sovereignty is about the protection of information and knowledge that concerns or originates from Māori groups. Māori have deep-rooted and fundamental rights to exercise decision-making wherever our data is concerned. And that's an important point to make because data is like land. And when your people have been alienated from their land, marginalized in their own home, one can reflect on how data can be used in a new digital world when it does not take into account 
indigenous rights and interests. Next slide, please. So far, no hapu and iwi and data storage have a long connection with the landscape. And we've stored our data in the landscape, in our songs, in our dance, in our carvings, in our moana, naming every rock, every river, every ocean, the sands, the plants, the nights, and the stars are very much our ancestors. So when we look at how our ancestors have recorded data in the past, we're reminded that there's many ways that data can re be represented. This is a maramataka Māori on the far side, or a Māori moon calendar, and Māori moon calendars also store data in so much as our climate is concerned. And when we look at climate change today, we're reminded that the traditional knowledge of our tribal groups is very much being looked at for answers. And who does that data belong to? Who does that information belong to? Should it just be open for everyone? Has everyone not taken enough? We don't know, but we must think about this. Next slide, please. So our vision and our mission are very much connected with our need and our desire to restore living language, to restore living language to the mouths of our grandchildren, to our parents, and in some cases, our grandparents. So we are about nurturing and proliferating the Māori language unique to the homelands of our tribal groups. But we work with other tribal groups, but we recognise that we have a mandate to work with our own, and we do not make decisions for others. Next slide, please. And so what is kaitiakitanga? What are Māori values and principles? You hear us use the word kaitiakitanga. Today it's very much... Uh, suggested to be guardianship, protectionship, stewardship, but it doesn't have any precise translation in te reo Māori. But these are things that kaitia kitanga represent in terms of concepts and ideas. Next slide, please. So we look back to look forward. And there's a famous tribal aphorism uh, amongst our tribal group, which says, e hoki whakamuri kia anga whakamua, which means you must return to where you came from to find a way forward. And so that can be applied in many, many different circumstances. In our circumstances, it was about interviewing our elders. This is my grandmother and my grand aunts who feature alongside many, many other elders from our tribes. And we recorded their stories about every rock, about every river, every plant in our ecosystem. And it represents a body of knowledge, a philosophical world view that we are aware is valuable in today's new world. Next slide, please. So we corpus gather in a range of domains, live video streaming competitions, on our marae, our re, uh, a recent um, iwi member was um, made a judge, so we live streamed that. We're providing access to content to our people that live all throughout the world. Suzanne mentioned yesterday that 86% of our people do not live in our tribal territory. So what does that mean for us when we think about reconnecting people with place? Uh, with uh, identity and with language. Next slide, please. And so we've developed our own um, digital platforms, and we purposefully did that because YouTube, Facebook, and other options were not going to do it for us. Because once we put our data in their platform, does it belong to us anymore? Who does it belong to? Who does it belong to? It's a big question because the whole idea of ownership and belonging is something that we had learned to understand through a painful journey, being disconnected from artifacts, being disconnected from objects, 
that scavengers had gathered throughout the generations of our tribal history um, in the colonial area. And then when we think about where they are today, they're in museums, they're in libraries, and the, the, we believe they're living objects. And of course, the decisions about their future are made by people that are not connected to them. So we needed to make sure that we were really clear with people that wanted to come to our platform because it was the house of our learning, the house of our language, the house of our stories. This whare upholds the principles of Māori data sovereignty. All content remains under the guardianship of the original distributor. Respect this whare and the kōrero within it. To learn more, you can access the Kaitiakitanga license in the settings. You can download our app on Android or your Apple phone or whatever. Next slide, please. That gave us the opportunity to work with all the other tribal stations. 21 tribal stations exist in Aotearoa. But one of the main ideas that we all connect on is whakapapa. This is one of the founding principles that Iwi Radio was developed on. And in some sense, it can be uh, attributed or connected to the idea of genealogy of DNA, but everything is connected. And so this is one of the most important things in our set of um, values. Next slide, please. We speak with our elders, and what we do is we document word for word what they say. For 30 years we've been talking to our old people, people that lived the life that many of us want to reconnect with. So here we're talking about anything and everything, taking people on a journey. As tribal broadcasters, it's our role to capture the stories and document them. But what we hadn't done is transcribed thousands of hours of Māori language content. We started that journey with a small group of experts, but can you imagine how long it takes to transcribe word for word the stories of our people. Next slide, please. So what we decided was to teach computers how to speak Māori, and that was an important journey for us. Next slide, please. We started a corpus gathering journey, and that was to work with our people to get them to read sentences in our language. We took on the challenge to invite people to participate, knowing that everything that everyone said about a tribal group taking on this challenge was not very positive or encouraging. Next slide, please. So what we first did was make sure that we had developed the terms of engagement or a license, an agreement, a relationship agreement and it's very much about opting in. So everyone's talking about opting out. For us, it's more important that people opt in. And the reason for that is we understand um, the, the journey we have been on and how important it was to make this engagement something that was based on our values and principles. So opting in was important for us. Next slide, please. And in 10 days, we gathered 316 hours of tagged language data. And we did that without knowing that it was going to be so successful. It's the largest tagged and labeled data set for natural language processing of our native language in the world. And we did that in a small tribal community, but what we did was reach out to every member of our iwi. We reached out to all other speakers of Te Reo Māori and asked them to help us. Next slide, please. And so we did that so that we could develop a future for our language in a digital sense. And it was practical, it was community-driven, 
And it was a way for us to create data sets with people they were opting in. They were able to not only opt in, but identify their language proficiency and help us with the metadata associated with the contributions that they were going to make. Next slide, please. And we needed to speed up the transcription of our archival data, and that's because we couldn't get through transcribing it all ourselves. It was a huge task, and we originally wanted not only to be the users of technology as broadcasters and language revitalization leaders in different projects that we're involved in, it was about making sure that we could develop the very tools that we were going to use. So what we wanted to do was reconnect with the language through development, and I'm talking about technology development and data governance because the way that we were going to govern our data, the way that we were going to manage our data, the way we were going to curate and make available data was going to pave the way for a preferred future or revisiting a past that many of us don't like to talk about because it's traumatic. So what we first arrived at was a 14% error rate which was phenomenal according to people that came into contact with us and what we were doing for Te Reo Māori. And transcribers, well, they're experts and they know what's good enough. So what we had was a tool that was good enough for us to start transcribing our data, building more corpus. Next uh, slide, please. So we built a platform called Kaituhi. Now, Suzanne is going to show in more detail and demonstrate how well these work, but it wasn't so much that we developed these or that they were developed. It was that we had capability and capacity work streams operating in parallel because it was so important for us to not only build tools but create jobs for our people. Next slide, please. And I want to talk about Orotukuiho, intergenerational transmission of sound. Yesterday we heard the keynote speaker talk about the archaeology of sound. We were sitting over there, overwhelmed, because we think about the same thing, but in a different context, calling it a different name. So it's wonderful to hear different theories being applied in different contexts. For us, it was about restoring sound so that we could reconnect people with place and identity. And when we think about our language and language loss, how pronunciation is really important when we want to convey a message in Te Reo Māori, one of our words means many, many different things. Applying it in different circumstances, it could be a noun, it could be a verb, it could be an adjective, it could be many things. And when we think about evolution versus assimilation, we have to be mindful that our language was purposefully harmed as a way to disestablish our systems of governance, our systems of decision making, and make us powerless in our own home. Next uh, sound, please. A sound slide. Now, pronunciation, it's something that we learned through our reading competition and our corpus gathering effort. We learned it was so important, and people wanted feedback on it. So we didn't just think about how we were going to develop speech-to-text technology or uh, text-to-speech technology. For us, we wanted to also develop a model that would measure pronunciation so that we were able to reconnect people with the sound of home, the sound of the land, because we understood that our language and the sounds that we make are connected with those landscapes, connected with those places, and connected to the ways that we had recorded our history and the body of knowledge that we uh, call Matauranga Māori. So we launched the Rongo app. Next slide, please. But to do that, we had to tag and label phonetical data. 
So we developed our own platform for tagging and labeling, labeling phonetical data. For example, kaua e wehi ki te kōrero i o whakaro. That's how we might say it. But then a second language learner might pronounce that quite differently. And to attain a native sound or to restore native sound, a sound that had been beaten out of the mouths of many of the members of our tribal groups, we needed to take into account what did native sound sound like. And so we referred back to the data that we had collected over 30 years. 30 years of data, including the oldest contributor who was born in 1892. And so when you think about the generations of sound and what that represents to a language revitalization group working in broadcasting and technology development, it means everything. Next slide, please. And so our Māori pronunciation app takes into account the pedagogy and the style of learning that our people had before the documentation of our language. And so what we focus on is listening. Often when we talk about communications, we're often talking about how to tell somebody something, tell a story. But listening is a forgotten skill. And I think that when we learned that listening was more important and then reading, what we did is develop a program that took into account the fact that when somebody read something, they read it out loud like they were connected with the sounds of the dominant language that they used all the time. So what we did was get people to listen and mimic. So there's no reading in our programs. It's all about listening and mimicking and offering feedback. Now, at the beginning, we thought we could actually give a percentage. But when you're dealing with language trauma, cultural trauma, alienation from language and culture, alienation from identity, what we learned was that non-Māori people didn't experience this experience the same way as Māori people. And so rather than giving someone uh, or identifying a percentage of correctness, we simply get them to repeat the word or the sound that we've identified there needs to be improvement in. Next slide, please. And so we started to look around what else was happening out there with our language. And we understood colonization, having experienced it intergenerationally. And for us, AI didn't represent a computer that was learning something. It represented a revisiting of the past atrocities that had been committed against our people. Next slide, please. And for example, when you go on to um, Google Translate, and it changes all the time, but one of the um, young Māori women in our uh, organization wrote, kia kaha wahi ne ma. And the translation of that was, let white women be strong. And in the context of what this actually means, it means, kia kaha, be strong woman. Because ma means the plural. What I'm talking about is cultural context when working with languages. And if you don't have the cultural context, what happens is one's interpretation of what is being said is sometimes misconstrued. Now, one could imagine that the wahine Māori or the Māori woman that were looking at this translation, it raised a lot of issues for them. And when we think about this other translation, kia ora wahine ma, which means greetings woman, the translation from the big tech company Google was save white woman. And so our woman 
raised concerns about that because we need to ensure the quality of the language is maintained. And one of our founding principles is do no harm. Do no harm. Next slide, please. And so we started to look at the Flora's data set. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this. But where is this data coming from? Where is this data coming from? And how has it been gathered? Has it been scraped from the internet? Who is actually translating what is said to be quality translations and quality audio recordings of our language? Next slide, please. And it took us back to a whole lot of communications that we re uh, received from a group called Lionbridge. Lionbridge sent out many, many invitations to indigenous language speakers throughout the world. The Kohanga Reo movement, the Kura Kaupapa movement, the Iwi Radio movement, which me and Suzanne work in. I'm the chairman of the Iwi Radio Network. We received this, soliciting our people to offer our language to them, give them recordings for $45 US an hour. Next slide, please. So we started to think, who is doing this? Who is doing this? And we had to start connecting the dots because to know your friends and our experience is also no, important to know the face of your enemy. And so we learned that there were big tech connections in the process of trying to gather information, data, and create technology for our language. Next slide, please. And so Suzanne and other experts in our team evaluated that data set. And what we found is it wasn't what it was said to be. In fact, when we looked at the quality of the data set, as native speakers and proficient second language learners and speakers of our language, our team quickly identified that the quality was very, very poor. And using poor quality data for an indigenous language that's always already been harmed through white assimilation, what good did they hope to do for us? And I want to say for us again. For us. And then we often hear, with us. For us and with us. But you don't hear by us very often, do you? And that's what we needed to be. We needed to be by Māori, for Māori. Because this was very much a process that was connected to breaking glass ceilings. When we were awarded a $14 million uh, award to teach computers how to speak Māori by the um, New Zealand government. It was a big step. It was one of the biggest investments in Māori language research, if not the biggest. And why I say that is because we're not an academic-led project. So the money that we receive goes into creating tools that we can put into the hands of our people. Next slide, please. So issues with OpenAI's whisper. Where did that data come from? Where did it come from? It's unclear where it come from, and there is no honesty. One of our founding principles is pono. Pono is about telling the truth. Now, how can you tell the truth if you're not being clear where the 1,300 hours of Te Reo Māori came from and the 400 hours of Olelo Hawaii, which is one of our sister languages, 
which is the indigenous language of the islands of Hawaii. Our language is a part of um, the Eastern Polynesian language group, and there are many other indigenous languages in that language group. I say this because transfer learning is an important opportunity for us when we think about language loss in other indigenous language groups and how we can use phonetical and other aspects of our data to perhaps develop models that can help us restore our languages because they are the carriers of the culture. And so, next slide please. So what we started to do was to design a new vision, a new vision of artificial intelligence for the people, by the people, working with the people. And this was an opportunity that we had to tell our story. And I would like to do a shout out to this group because they provided us with an opportunity to tell our story. We aren't saying that our way is the way. What we're saying is we have something to contribute in terms of the wider conversation because there are many perspectives, but our perspective has been something that intergenerationally has been silenced. And when we talk about that silence, that silence can be so loud. Next slide, please. And so we are now looking at Māori language bilingual ASR. And the reason for that is because we have to take into account that many of our people don't speak our language because of language uh, loss. So we, when we do speak our language, we often speak it with other languages, for example, English. And we code switch between languages. Ka kōrero Māori ahau, engari inahihia hau ki te tuku i te tahi atu whakaaro i rotu i te reo Pākeha, I code switch back into English. And I'm sure other people do that, that are bilingual as well. And so we wanted to develop technology that reflected our ability and the fact that we are citizens of the world. Next slide, please. And so our approach is something that takes into account options. We know that there is open source technology out there we have enjoyed the opportunity to test out our data sets using open source software. And it's provided us with a special opportunity to refine and perfect what we do. Um, but what we won't do is go public with those tests because it's important for us to lead the development of things that we are, ground, uh, we are absolutely certain are grounded in our values and principles. Because if we can't uphold the very principles and values that we talk of, what does that say about us? And so that has very much been a part of our journey. Not just talking the talk, but walking that talk. Next slide, please. And so we know where our data comes from. It comes from the Fare Kōrero app that I talked about earlier. It comes from our strategic partners, who we help, who they help, who have shared interests, and we develop shared benefits. Kōrero Māori that I talked about earlier, Kaituhi, Suzanne's going to demo all of this stuff in her workshop. And the Common Voice, which was associated um, with other work in New Zealand around English language corpus gathering. Next slide, please. And so our Papareo APIs can be read about and you can contact us about them by going to papareo.io or papareo.nz. And I want to mention that because speech recognition, pronunciation modeling, speech synthesis, all those sorts of things were big steps for us. And we wanted to be an example for other people that want to develop their own solutions as well. The important part from our perspective is knowing the data and being accountable for the data. Why? Because we captured that data based on trust. Based on trust, 30 years of trust with the community, not only that we represent, 
that we come from. And I think that's a key difference. We're working with our grandparents' data, with our cousins' data, with our aunties and uncles' data. We're not working with someone else's data. And we don't think of ourselves as individuals first. We first think of ourselves and identify ourselves by naming the natural grouping of people that we come from, which is our whānau, our hapu, and our iwi. So our approach to data governance also does not prioritise the individual, because that is a worldview, a Western worldview, that doesn't belong in our culture. And we wanted to be sure about prioritising the collective before the individual. Next slide, please. So our Kaitiaki Tanga license is very much a relationship agreement. It's a relationship agreement with those people that want to use our tools and us, the creators of those tools. It's important for me to mention that it's connected with our vision. It's connected with our mission. It's connected with our long and rich whakapapa, our long and rich genealogy, not only our genealogy that is of our uh, tribal groups to the ancestors that we recognise as eponymous ancestors of our whānau, hapu and iwi, but our relationship with other tribal groups, knowing that relationships are so important. And so it... At some level, the licensed software has been built with the intention of enabling intergenerational transmission of language and culture, restoring that, remembering that land alienation is what happened first. And then when we think about land alienation, why did that happen? It had commercial value. And all of a sudden, we hear terms like cultural misappropriation. And where do we find the marks of our tribal groups, our tāmoko? Where do we find the symbols of our tribal groups? We find them in spaces now that have commercial opportunity. And we felt that it's only right that commercial opportunity should be preserved for those people that the language belongs to, and we question data ownership of our language. Next uh, slide, please. And so what drives us in our decision making? And I want to talk about what drives us because that's an important part of this journey because I took us on a journey that spoke to our past. And we want to build a Māori language economy. When I say we, I'm talking about the royal we, people working in the Māori revitalization space, the Māori development space. We, as Tehiku Media, want to ensure that we are providing a contribution to that, advancing data science in Aotearoa from a community-led Māori perspective, strengthening data sovereignty, mana motuhake, self-determination, Indigenous language outcomes, including positive economic, education, environmental, social, and cultural impacts, and being a platform to connect with others in our specific language group, which is in the Pacific. Building iwi capability and capacity, data acquisition aspirations consistent with our values and our principles, building indigenous collaboration opportunities and economies of scale for language in this new digital space, and building indigenous-led natural language research excellence. And those are things that are important uh, to us and drive our relationships that we decide to have or not to have. Next slide, please. So we want to ensure that the data is protected because we understand that the data is the land. And when we think about how many of our people are houseless in our own home, when we think about the fact that 17% 
of the population in New Zealand is Māori, yet our women are the most incarcerated indigenous women in the world. More than 50% of the male jail population is Māori. We're reminded what data can mean in different circumstances. And we didn't want to just look at the negative statistics. We wanted to create data sets that provided an opportunity for development of a preferred future. Next slide, please. And so it's about those values and principles. And as I mentioned earlier, it's very much grounded on the relationship first. Next slide. Oh, I'll, this one here, I do want to mention, if you want to learn more about Māori data sovereignty and principles, check it out. Um, there is a group called the Māori Data Sovereignty Network. They have some amazing uh, experts in that group. Yesterday, uh, Suzanne mentioned Tahu Kukutai. She is someone to connect with on the wider issues of Māori data sovereignty. Next slide, please. So our values and principles that I've referred to quite widely are rangatiratanga, sovereignty. Whakapapa, genealogy. Whanaungatanga, relationships. Kotahitanga, unity. But still providing the opportunity for diversity in our unity. We don't all have to think the same, but we can at least agree on some founding principles. Manakitanga, which perhaps could represent the idea of reciprocity, but it's more than that, because it takes into account the idea of taking care of people and people taking care of you. And that sort of relationship that is grounded on a community living experience rather than that of the individual. Kaitiaki tanga is guardianship, and it's important for us to recognize that we prioritize guardianship and belonging over ownership. Because all those artifacts, body parts of our ancestors that are in European museums, that we're repatriating at the moment, who owns them? Who owns them? That is the question. Is it the place of those decision makers to reinterpret those things in digital formats and provide open access to them? I'm just asking that question because guardianship reminds us that those things belong somewhere else. They belong with their people and in their own homes. Next slide, please. And so we prohibit use of our technology in circumstances that involve surveillance, tracking, discrimination, persecution, unfairness, and anything that is inconsistent with those above principles, including the use of our tools to create other language data sets. So don't go and reinvent what we're doing so that you can lead what we believe should be Māori-led. That is the idea that we're trying to share with the people that come into contact with us for the purposes of using our tools. And I think that's a special starting point for a conversation because it takes into the, uh, to account that this isn't just about teaching computers how to speak our language. There's more to it. Next slide, please. And so it's very much like a memorandum of understanding the preamble. It takes us back to the ideas that saw us emerge as a tribal broadcaster and developer and a tribal uh, data science group in the first place. And it reminds us about what that is. Next slide, please. So how might we license data and tech? You can check our um, check out our, um, our, our our links on on here. Please just check them out, and you know we're only too happy to talk about more um, ideas. But we do believe that profits made from data should go back to the communities 
from where the data originates. And, and that's a really important point that I want to make. Next slide, please. Is there a next slide? I think that might be the last slide. Okay, then, kia ora e te whanau. Thank you so much for having me. If anybody's got any questions, I'm only too happy to, to share a, an answer with you. Well, Peter, you've taught us a lot, and uh, I think I'm... The, the, the quote that you had about data is land is going to stay, I think, with many of us. But we've got five minutes for quick questions. Um, I think we've got five minutes, is that right? Can someone indicate? Yes, five minutes. Um, so, I'm looking out at our lovely audience. Who would like? We've got five minutes, a couple of questions. Fantastic. One person there. Hi, uh, my name is Amanda, I'm from Brazil. I was very interested about everything. I read about you on that series of AI stories. I'm not sure which magazine now. Um, and it, I'm so happy to see you here and hear your story. I was actually wondering if there are any other indigenous communities that you are collaborating with around the world because uh, this seems so uh, interesting, for example, for indigenous communities in the Amazon that could definitely use this technology that you guys have built, um, that you have mentioned your concerns of the technology being used by uh, people in places of power uh, wrongly, but uh, what are your plans in terms of sharing this technology with other indigenous populations around the world? Kia ora. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're working with um, the Kanaka Maoli um, people, um, sharing ideas, sharing our experiences, but also sharing access to the platforms and the technology that we've developed. Um, we've uh, started to engage with our First Nations people from Canada. We're also mindful, though, that we're not here to lead um, uh, solutions for other indigenous people. What we are happy to do is share our technology and for them to adapt it to their unique set of circumstances because language loss and language decline has many faces. It has many faces and it emerges in so many different ways and, and the short answer is um, yes we are. Uh, but those are two examples of, of groups that we are working with. Yes, just thank you very much for, for your presentation. Um, I'm afraid my question was just asked by Amanda. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I just wanted to add that if this community can be of service to your project and other projects to come, we're happy to do it. Absolutely. Um, being here has reminded me and given me a new sense of confidence in the legal fraternity. <laughs> and what we would... <laughs> <laughs> and what we would love is to see how our license can be adapted to the different set of legal circumstances that we find in Europe, America, Australia, because it's very much about co copyright, but it's also about privacy, and it's also about preserving future opportunities. And so if there are any lawyers out there that would like to um, be part of our experiment, please come and talk to me because we need all the help that we can get. Kia ora. I'm just checking, there's one person there. Can we quickly get a um, quick question from lady over there? That's great. Please tell us your name, where you're from. Fantastic. Thank you, Eunice Mercado, and I've been working with governments and more and more when, they, when governments are addressing the issue of open science, they are thinking and creating policies on how to integrate the knowledge of indigenous communities. Short answer, unless someone in the room have a better, has a better answer, they don't know yet how to do it. And most of the reasons why they don't know how yet how to do it is because they say and they argue that they, there are no model like ongoing that kind of proves the concept that this can be done. I wonder if What's your thought about it? I think we've got to remind ourselves that systems of power that have removed the autonomy 
and systems of decision making from many di indigenous groups often make up excuses. They often make up excuses about th why this can't be done and why that can't be done. But we must challenge. And I think our um, contribution to that would be the legal framework that we operate within can be a lever that we pull in certain times. And our journey has certainly been about that. Uh, what I would say is that data governance of data that is in our, um, uh, in our own area, in our own whare, in our own house is one thing, but uh, sitting alongside of this is data repatriation. And I think it's important to think about storage and it's important to think about why we brought a supercomputer to run our own models so that we could put more money into people rather than spending models in the cloud because we just could not afford that. But I would say that it is connected with power and control and that as allies, it's important to challenge. Challenge that control. Challenge that power. Kia ora. Thanks, Peter. So, what a keynote, Peter. I think all of us in this audience are going away with lots of thoughts, ideas. And Peter, and, Stan, and I'm going to plug your, your, your uh, when is it, Stan? It's this afternoon, isn't it? Tomorrow. It's tomorrow. So please go to Suzanne's uh, uh, pa panel talk tomorrow and hear more about what is going on. I know we're now running to other things, but please, can you thank Peter for an extraordinary keynote?